on uh, what the real issues are in this district. So this is um, the race for the second Plymouth and Bristol Senate District, in case anybody is in the wrong room. <laughs> Just want to make sure. And this Senate district includes Brockton, Halifax, Hanover, Hanson, Plimpton, and Whitman, as well as three precincts in East Bridgewater and two precincts in Easton. I'm Callie Crossley, and I'm going to be your moderator tonight. And joining me uh, for the, on the questioning, anyway, Ed Donga of Enterprise News. and Aaron Dale of WATD. <laughs> and so now, just a brief introduction of our candidates. Uh, Michael Brady is closest to me. He's the Democratic State Rep for the 9th Plymouth District. He's served there seven and a half years. Vice Chair of the House Committee on Bonding, Capital Expenditures, and State Assets. Before that, he was on the Brockton School Committee in the late 1990s and City Council for 13 years. Um, he has been endorsed by U.S. Representatives Stephen Lynch and William Keating, Keating and um, also has some support from Elizabeth Warren. Jeff Deal, Republican State Rep for the 7th Plymouth District. In 2010, he upset the Democratic incumbent, Alan McCarthy, five years in the State House. He fought for the gas tax, uh, fought against the gas tax, <laughs> introduced a ballot question in the House, which was successful, uh, representing Whitman, Abington, East Bridgewater, um, I think you probably have heard his slogan, The Real Deal. <laughs> He's endorsed by Governor Charlie Baker and Lieutenant Governor Karen Polito. And also joining us, the independent candidate, Anna Raddick. She's of Halifax. She's new to politics, works at Hallmark, um, and is uh, wanted to get into this race to express herself. So we're going to start off with... Uh, 60 seconds, one minute of opening statements from each of the candidates, and then we'll open up for more questions from me and then from Ed and from Aaron. Um, and this is a kind of a, a, a looser format so that we don't want to be so restricted, but nobody's going to drone on. So when we get into the regular questioning and the answers, we want about 90 seconds from you guys, and there are some very helpful folks with 30 seconds to let you know when your end time is. But we want to make sure that we have good follow-up and a chance for both of you or all three of you to feel as though you've been heard. So, you know, if you need to add something, let me know. And Ed and Aaron may be jumping in as well just to follow up. So that's, that's the kind of vibe we want to have tonight. Okay? All right. So let's start with opening statements. Um, Michael Brady, why don't you go first? Thank you very much. And I want to thank uh, Stonehill College for hosting the Samatan Institute. I know we're standing and sitting in a beautiful building. I want to thank the Shields family for all their contributions to Stonehill College and uh, Kelly Crowley, Ed Donga, Aaron Deal, and all the people who showed up tonight on your busy schedule because you are the most important people, the residents that we're looking to represent. My name is Mike Brady and I'm a current state representative representing the district here. I've lived here all my life and I've never had anything handed to me. I've worked all my life. I've worked at Superior Bakery in Brockton, I've worked at Milan News and I worked my way to pay for my schooling at Massasoit Community College. I then went on to the insurance business and owned and operated a business in the district here. Later on, I wasn't happy with the things that were, I've seen around me. We can't live in the past. but Things had changed over time, so I ran for the school committee, got elected, moved on to the city council, and I later became a state representative. And I lived right across from our good friend Tom Kennedy. And not only was a friend and a great advocate, and no one, none of us here, as good as we all are, will replace him, and we know that. But uh, he was a great friend and mentor and a great advocate to our district. And I want to thank him, and I know some of his family is here today as well, but thank him for his service. And I want to thank all of you for coming tonight. This is very important. And I look forward to moving on. It's going to be a natural transition if I am elected your next state senator. Thank you. I'm just going to say it will probably go a little faster if you all don't clap after everything <laughs> and just give them a chance to talk. So, Jeff Deal. Thanks, Kelly. I appreciate it. Can you hear me? Yeah, okay, good. I'm sorry I have a sore throat. Um, so, yeah, the state senate seat I'm running for is open because 
we all know we had a tragic loss of a man whose shoes would be very hard to fill, um, as Mike uh, said. And I was fortunate to know and work with Senator Kennedy, having passed local legislation together. He set the bar, too, for constituent service, which I've always tried to emulate in the district that I have now. Uh, but this election, November 3rd, is very important. It's going to be about who has a proven track record of working to grow jobs, who wants to keep our state the leader in education, who will protect taxpayers, and who's going to work for the people, not insiders. And I'm the candidate in this race who's proven to cut taxes. My opponent has voted to increase taxes at every opportunity. And as a family man, I know the heavy burden of taxes. By the way, I should mention, thank my wife for coming out tonight uh, to help support me. And my daughters are being watched right now. But, um, you know, it's, it's hard in the state, obviously, to uh, make a living. Um, one of the things that, you know, affected us was the gas tax going up every year without a vote if it had been allowed to stand. Uh, I led the successful repeal of that automatic increase. Uh, which would have cost taxpayers billions. I blocked legislative pay raises that would have been done during uh, informal sessions without a vote. And I also stepped forward and worked with uh, somebody from another party to block the Olympics from taking taxpayer money for overruns. So I have a vision for the state and the Senate district, and I want to provide a future and an opportunity for our children, our grandchildren, incentivize hard work and innovation, reward veterans for their service to our country, and take care of seniors in retirement who have made Massachusetts great. Um, maybe it's just the Eagle Scout in me that says, you know, leave the campground better than we found it. Uh, but I intend to work every day as your senator hard and make that a reality for you all. So thank you very much. Anna Reddick. Oh, thank you. Hi, I'm Anna Grace Raddick. Um, the reason why I'm running is because I wrote three laws to protect citizens from white-collar crime and human trafficking. Um, br just briefly, one law would require 40 hours of counseling by a third-party secular counselor or clergy for American and immigrant couples before they can get married, whereby a green card is obtained, which is um, by a person who's trained and certified to spot the just, sorry to spot human trafficking signs, which are druggedness, changes in behavior, and isolation from family and friends. I don't think federal immigration officers should be um, allowed to give these interviews because actually it's not mandated that they do and they're not, it's kind of a conflict of interest. Also I think there should, I have another initiative that would be to install educational kiosks in every federal immigration office where Americans and immigrants are about to be married for a green card. They can get more information about what human trafficking Ten is seconds. and what resources are available to help them. Also I made an ID protection program utilizing local, state and federal authorities a victim of trafficking, financial trafficking, could go to their local police and there would be a database in place, a statewide human trafficking officer working with um, the federal police and there would be a, a civil approved, approved um, name and social security number available to them within two weeks. Right now it could take three to seven years. Okay. Sometimes never and people can die. Yeah. Want to be so. fair. So. Thank you. <laughs> So let me start with uh, the two of you on the end who have uh, a record of voting and ask for a fuller explanation about a couple of votes that you, that you have taken just to get this ball rolling. So Mike Brady, you were the only vote against the budget. Um, why? Well, I was concerned. Um, you know, we always are looking to get funding for our district and it was a conference committee report vote. Uh, we actually did a voice vote on the budget. But the conference committee report took away um, workers' rights, and I've always been supportive of workers' rights, and I wasn't happy with that. And we tried to get things changed in the budget, and we, we were told that um, moving forward, if, this, if these workers' rights were, were going to be taken away, they weren't hurt the workers. They weren't going to go out to private companies and take away uh, employees' benefits and, and lay off some employees. And we're already seeing that they're trying to privatize the industry that we're talking about. And it's not just one industry with the MBTA. We know there needs to be fixed with the MBTA. The, the, our, our train system is in devastating. We've seen it. It's in devastating shape. We've seen it with the past winter. But it's not just about that. It's about all workers' rights. And I've, you know, I worked at Superior Baker. I belonged to the Bakers and Confectionery Union. I drove a truck from Malaya News when I was working my way through college, and I joined the Teamsters driving a truck. And I know how important, how important and hard people work to get these rights. And once you give something away, you never get it back. And I've seen it time and time again. So it's about protectors, workers' rights. Okay. 
Um, Jeff Deal, you voted against uh, increasing the minimum wage from $9 to $11, one of 24 votes uh, against it. Why? So the minimum wage, what, there was a, the, basically it was a vote just to increase the minimum wage. Uh, the caucus I'm in came up with a package, and I felt that the package was right. To basically, we needed to do more than ma raise the minimum wage. We needed to add earn income tax credits to that package because, quite honestly, the minimum wage, when you get to when you add when it goes up to eleven dollars an hour, it's still only around twenty-three thousand. That's really not what's fully needed to help working families. We wanted to add the earned income tax credit to that as well. And the other part about the uh, minimum wage is it's good to have an increase if you have a job, but we're looking at corporations right now um, that are potentially laying off people as minimum wage comes, comes in uh, and goes up to an increase. I don't want to cut any jobs. I wanted to make sure that we did it in a way that, like I said, with the earned income tax credit, uh, allows them to be working and then have that gap filled that, that way instead of doing the minimum wage increase. You know, it, that's, that's basically the reason for that vote. Okay. Can you all see the timer over there just, just to... She's sitting in the chair right oh. here. Um, and you don't have to look at me. These are the people that are voting. Right. So, that's so just to give you a better sense. Anna Raddick, you mentioned now uh, uh, that you have written some bills. And I'm not quite sure that I understand what you mean by that. Because what, what you don't have a record. You're new to politics. What do you mean you've written bills? Well, I'd, I'd written some, um, some bills, basically, um, that would need to be passed. Two would need to be passed federally. So oh, that you would introduce yes. if, should you be elected. Okay. And, and getting All this right. job as state senator would allow me to. Oh, sorry. Um, uh, getting this job as state senator would allow me to pass these um, laws to prevent human trafficking, um, which would help Americans and foreigners. Foreigners are sometimes brought here and intimidated into um, certain situations. And also, um, uh, my third initiative is an anti-white collar crime bill, which is an ID protection program available through local police. It util utilizes local, state, and federal authorities. It's an interagency um, cooperative plan, whereby um, a victim could go to local police, ask, you know, say, you know, hey, I'm a victim of financial trafficking or what have you, and um, they could apply for this um, new ID, and there would be a statewide human trafficking officer. Thank you very much. Um, um, I appreciate the ability to um, tell people about this. Um, uh, so um, there would be a d new database in place, um, and within two weeks, an individual could get a new ID. Right now, there's so many delays. Witness protection is actually um, not suitable for these types of crimes. And my um, pro program is different because it would allow people to live with their family and friends in their hometowns. So. Um, this particular You've got five seconds. Okay, this particular program also um, um, uh, right now it can take three to seven years to get a new social security number from the Social Security Administration, if at all. There's a lot of delays and there's also a lot of lost paperwork. So let um, me just just to be clear, yes. would you want to weigh in on how you might have voted on A, the minimum wage increase, or B on the budget? Or is your entire focus on the human trafficking? Um well I, uh, I went to school for English literature and business, so I, I thought that if I do get the job, I, I think I have the skills, the skill set to become a good uh, state senator. And so what is your question? Is it about the... Um, My question is, uh, are, would you, are, where do you stand on some of these issues that, that uh, Rep. Deal and, and Rep. Brady have had to vote on as um, uh, House representatives? Um, I, I, su I support minimum wage increases. Um, I think that the, the federal standard of the increase is a good thing um, to $10 an hour. There's a lot of people that um, don't make very much in this area. And okay. So Would you have voted against the budget as Mike Brady did for the um, reasons he stated? Um, would I have voted against the budget? Mm -hmm. Well, even though I do support the um, a minimum wage increase, I, I'm, I kind of... Uh, I do like Deal's approach of um, fiscal conservatism. Um, so okay, thank you. So you're half and half up here. Yes, I'm, I'm all right. Got it. Thank all you. right. <laughs> well, let's talk about some taxes. I feel like I'm just giving you a gift, Rep. Deal. <laughs> but anyway, because <laughs> uh, I know that that is one of your uh, central issues, and you've talked about really uh, wanting to pay attention to the pocketbook of the citizens of the district. 
And I wonder if uh, you could speak to whether or not you put anything in the budget, this budget that we've been discussing specifically that might have impacted both Whitman and Abington if, from your seat as a House rep. No, there's no, I don't have any earmarks per se in the budget. Um, generally, my votes tend to be, you know, for what's good for the, the household. And, and again, in my opinion, uh, you know, this budget was a reasonable uh, solution for um, the, the tax dollars spent. Um, I will say, you know, again, Representative Brady uh, vote against the budget um, for the reasons he stated. I, I think the, the governor was asking for all the tools that he needed to fix the T. And I think, you know, Every, every Republican, every Democrat in the House agreed that we were going to give him those tools, including the Chairman of Transportation, who, you know, so I think it was a reasonable budget uh, overall. It satisfied the household needs, the town needs, and at the same time, I think it gave him what, you know, we needed to have to, to make a step towards fixing the T, which is, you know, pretty important. You know, we, we, it, that thing shut down, and people were not able to get to work. You know, companies had lost time, and, uh, you know, all we're asking now is, for basically the T to have the opportunity to um, manage itself better than it's been done. You know, we've had uh, you know terrible decisions made at the T for a long time. We had uh, the former general manager double the number of hundred thousand dollar salaries. We had two point two. We found that there was two point two billion dollars available uh, for the T to do to take care of deferred maintenance. They never did any of that work. Uh, so now we we need these tools to get going, and I, I think it's important to work together to get that done. Um, so you, you took me over to, to actually oh, talk sorry, about yeah. the MBTA. That's okay, because I, this is a discussion I wanted to have with you anyway. So let me just follow up this way. Um, Governor Baker has said he will not say yet whether or not um, an increase uh, in, in fares is something that he would not consider. So he's leaving that option open to your point. Well, the good news yeah. is the speaker, the speaker actually said today that he thinks fares should be the last thing we, uh, fare increases would be the last thing we consider. Yes, yeah, the last resort. Um, that's Bob DeLeo's um, statement. There are some commuter stations at Lakeville and Brockton, so this is very much a part of, you know, how this, this district could be impacted. And the governor has appointed a very strong, it seems to me, um, uh, uh, board to look at all of these, but if they get to the end of the line, <laughs> no pun intended, and you know some other revenue has to happen, um, how wh where will you sit on that? Well, let me just say mm -hmm. another thing. From the Whitman train station, commuter rail station, in the town I live in, it's three hundred and sixty-two dollar monthly fare plus eighty dollars for parking. You're already getting to the point where you're paying for a car, you're paying for the insurance, and probably a portion of the gas to to not take the T. We're getting to the point where we're making the commuter rail not actually financially viable for somebody to be taking in and out of Boston other than the time to get in and out. And by the way, when you have the delays we've had with the T, you, don't, you can't even guarantee that the time in and out is, is good enough right now. So again, there's, there's been management issues, and I'm not saying it's the, the laborers at all that have been had a problem at the T. It's been management issues that have been really horrendous for a long time. They made decisions to purchase a train rail down to Connecticut to match up with Connecticut. Connecticut never had a reciprocal agreement. About $26 million wasted on purchasing land that there was never going to be a connection to. Uh, we've also uh, had rail bought for Gillette Stadium that, you know, again, why are we doing a giveaway for, for a big corporation that makes quite a bit of money? Um, they've been taking a lot of money away from what could have been going to deferred maintenance or could have been going to, uh, uh, you know, more employees to take care of things. Uh, the other thing, too, is that... So your point is there's money there. There's so money look there. At, oh, okay. and, the, and the other yeah. thing, too, just uh -huh. Keolis, the uh, company that's managing yes. the T now, there was no incentive or or disincentive in the contract to collect fares. There was over $100 million, we found out, not collected in fares uh, that could have gone, again, towards you know, improving service or more reliability. Uh, so it was a bad contract with a private company, but you, 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 know, you can blame private companies, but you can also blame the fact that we had a terrible negotiation with them when we set that first up. Okay, so Mike Brady, um, uh, Rep. Deal has said, you know, bad management, um, uh, fare increases definitely should be the last resort, and, and we're talking about a very expensive train ride into Boston for people of this district if something isn't, doesn't happen. So how do you feel? Um, House uh, Leader Bob DeLeo today said fare increases should be the last resort. Governor Baker has said nothing goes off the table. There's a now strong oversee, uh, board overseeing the hopefully improvement of the T. Where, where are you on this? Well, this is one idea that I think the representative and myself agree on. You can't blame the workers for the administration's uh, not doing a, of a good job. And, you know, there's talk about expansion down to the line going through the town of Easton all the way down to New Bedford. 
which is great to help out the people in the Bedford, but we, we don't have enough money to fix the existing railways we have now. I think we have to do a better job fixing the mess we have now than to look at more further expansion, especially when we have the, the deficit we have. But we've got to find a way to pay for it, you know? Uh, you know, nobody likes to pay taxes. I don't like to pay taxes. I own a home in Brockton here. Our taxes are high, but we've got to find a way to, to fund that. And I think we've got to look at all other options, but I do agree with the, the speaker about the no new rate increases, but we've got to look at every option. And, you know, you don't want to hurt the business community as well. That's why I've uh, supported earned income tax credits and the angel investment tax credit to help businesses out, to help people invest in the community, uh, to save on their taxes. But we've got to look at any way we can get revenue. And, uh, you know, raising rates are not the answer but we've got to look at every other option available. I'll just point out that if the control board comes up not empty, but unable to control this anoretic, um, it means that um, this comes back to the legislature, and then comes back to the Senate and the House uh, to make a decision about how they would then help save the tea. And that, we're really talking about money. Where would you come down? Uh, well, I don't want to take sides or anything, but I I, I like the idea of um, the oh dear <laughs> oh, I like the uh, I like kind of deals uh, overview of the T looking for um, um, more management types of um, things that um, could be done to to um, just basically make sure the spending is um, you know good and not um, you know not rec not reckless spending and um, I, but I'm kind of a moderate. I mean, I know that sometimes taxes do need to be raised for certain things, so I don't know, really, but um, uh, anyway, yeah, thank you. Okay. If I can add, so yes, we, we, the best move that, that the current administration has done, though, with the mess with the T, we, we put a gentleman who was in charge of the highway system, did a fantastic job, and now he's put in the, from, the, from the frying pan right to the fire, but he's a Brockton gentleman who is now put in place to take over this whole mess with the T, and I think that's the best move that the governor has done. Yeah. Can I, I, just, I want to throw something in there. Um, the other thing is, is taking a look at the way things are done and saying, you know, maybe we should question some of this stuff. The pension fund for the T, there was a gentleman a few years ago we found out that had worked for the investment fund, went to work for one of the investment houses that dealt with the T, got a $25 million investment from the pension fund, and then it disappeared virtually overnight. We didn't know about it in the legislature for a year later. Okay? So some of these things that it's hard to turn over the stones, but we need to turn over those stones to find where we may not have to raise revenue. Make sure that we're doing the best practices as far as cooling off periods for employees that go to work for an agency that can go to work for a, a company that deals with them so that we don't have you know, potentially questionable practices going on where we end up losing money like that. And, and the representative mm -hmm. brought up a great point. Uh, no disrespect to him, but before he got in the state legislature, we passed pension reform, we passed ethics reform because of the mess that was done from prior administrations. We finally got that put in place and it's helped up tremendously. In over, oversight even on us as elected officials, we passed reform because of the abuse that went on prior to both of us getting in there, but it happened under my first administration as a freshman legislature. Okay. Ed Dunga. Oh, what's the question? I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, oh, no, I was asked, giving, throwing it to Ed to ask some questions. <laughs> Uh, uh, this question is going to focus on the opiate epidemic that's currently plaguing the region. Uh, as, you guys, as all of you know, it's a major issue here. So Governor Baker recently came out with a proposal on what he would like to do to address some of these issues. One of the um, questions, one of the issues he proposals he raised was limiting doctors to prescribing a 72-hour supply of opiates to um, patients, except for emergency circumstances. Uh, I'll direct this question first to uh, Representative Deal, and then any other candidate can follow up. But um, do you believe that the 72 hours supply is a good idea, or does it handcuff uh, doctors who say it kind of infringes on their clinical judgment? It's an, it's an interesting point. And um, I've been talking to a lot of people in this district when I was going door to door and making calls to their houses. There was a gentleman who's in the medical field who felt that it was an intrusion on doctors. Um, judgment, uh, but we, we also know that there's been young kids with sports industry, injuries that have been given long, you know, many weeks worth of, of opiate-based medication 
when they probably could have had less. I, I actually agree, well, I agree with the governor on this. this. He also has a 72-hour hold uh, plan as far as um, if somebody has an overdose, they're going to hold them for 72 hours. I know what's happened is there's this Narcan that's able to, uh, naloxone, which is able to revive people. And um, what happens is if they revive and then they can leave the hospital within a few hours, they sometimes go out and take another dose, but the naloxone acts as a multiplier effect on it. So he also has that plan for 72-hour hold of somebody. That may become a civil liberty issue that we have to debate during this when, when the governor's bill comes out. Um, but, but that's another interesting aspect. I will say I think the 72-hour supply is a reasonable uh, uh, expectation, uh, and I hope doctors do see themselves as, as a part of a partner in trying to fix this, not being picked on in, in generally. Mm -hmm. Mike Brady, Andrew, yes, would you? Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Ed. Um, you know, this is a very serious issue that's devastating families for much too long. And I do agree with the governor on the 72-hour uh, 72 supply, but also uh, we passed legislation to address this issue in the last semester, the last term in, in the State House, with all of us agreeing upon it, but it was not enough. We finally got the legislation started, at least. And it's helped out, but again, it's not enough. 14 days in the rehabilitation facility is by far not enough. The recidivism that's happening with these young people day in and day out is causing too many deaths. And I don't care if families are from cities such as Brockton and Bedford or much more affluent communities like Weston and Dover, which the cliche was in the olden days. Oh, it's not happening in our, in our society. I've been to church meetings in Easton. I've been to meetings in Hanson, all across the district. And, and Governor Baker, following the footsteps of Governor Patrick, who we passed the legislation to start, has carried the ball moving forward and had hearings with our mayor in Brockton and on a task force board. So I've been to their hearings in Plymouth addressing this issue. We need to get stronger legislation. We finally passed a supplemental budget this past year to put more funding and open up more beds and, and facilities to get these kids help. But time and time again, too many families are losing their children. And we have to do more. That's why I found a piece of legislation to extend the time in a rehabilitation facility beyond the 14 days, because that is not enough. We have to do more. Can I, can I add on a question? Uh, uh, yeah. uh, Really. I'm going to ask you guys not to, not to clap so we can just keep going. I really just want a quick follow-up, and that is um, both uh, House Speaker DeLeo and the Massachusetts Medical Society are very unhappy with a limit of 72 hours. Um, both people saying that, you know, that if you have people who are suffering day to day, that that limits them and what they can do from a medical perspective. Just want you to weigh in on that. And, and um, Rep. Deal, you can, would you fold that into your answer that you were about to give me just a second ago? Well, you know, yeah. no bill goes out, uh, goes into the House and Senate without changes. So if ultimately the debate ends up modifying that 72 hours, that's certainly where, uh, you know, people from outside the State House can weigh in, talk to their legislators, and, and we will ultimately come up with a compromise that I think works out. Um, the only thing I wanted to add, too, was, um, Last two weeks ago, we had a, a uh, vote on um, criminalizing fentanyl, which gets cut into heroin. Okay, and fentanyl has been recognized as probably one of the most deadly elements of heroin right now. And what's happening is they're trying to wean uh, people from fentanyl, uh, heroin with fentanyl in it to fentanyl straight up because it's, you don't need poppy seeds to make it. It's less of a you know, hindrance to, to make. You can make it right here. And um, we voted to criminalize it. There was an amendment to uh, create a mandatory minimum uh, sentencing for dealers of fentanyl specifically. And um, I, I know Representative Brady was a vote against that. I just was curious to hear the reasons why we would not want to take people off the streets who are dealing in what has been pretty well known as the death, dead, most deadly part of, of heroin and the opiate crisis right here. Well, I'm glad you brought this question up because it's a proven fact that mandatory sentences on drug addiction has not worked. We have mandatory sentences right now currently that if you're caught dealing drugs in a school zone, you get a mandatory year, but these, these uh, lawyers are plea bargaining and the mandatory sentences are not holding true. And if you don't get a young child help, they're going to go right back on the streets, fall right prey to these drug dealers, and fall right to the cracks again. We need help for these children. We need to put them in a place where they're going to get uh, help and, and to get sustained help, not only while they're in a facility, but afterwards. They're in jail. They're not getting the help. I want to put the severe drug dealers away, of course, like we all do. But you need help for these children that are getting uh, preyed upon. And then later on, they're out in the streets. They're not getting the help. 
We have to do follow-up after the fact. Uh, and, and, and I want to add, if I may, the governor also has a task force that we all agree with the leadership in the House and the Senate and the governor, and they agreed to pass this bill as it is to get it passed because there would have been more debate. It never would have passed. And you know how difficult it is to get legislation passed if all sides don't agree. They agreed on the bill that was put before us without any amendments, and then the governor's task force is looking at the other side with the mandatory sentence part. Ed, did you have something else to add? Uh, I do want to follow up with one question. Um, Weighing in on the, obviously in the governor's proposal there's many different aspects to it, but one of the things that I was curious about is when it comes to prevention versus treatment of people currently battling addiction. And how do you, do you think we should best be aligning our resources, particularly with there's always a chronic shortage of beds trying to find people, um, trying to find people a place to recover. So how would you weigh in on that when it comes to prevention versus um, helping these people in the midst of this uh, crisis. Representative Deal? Sure. Well, I mean, part of what is uh, built, the plan is to have uh, resource officers in the schools. I, I, in the town of Whitman, where I live, we have a great DARE officer who interfaces with his offices in the middle school. He interfaces with school administration. He is at the bus stops uh, and drop-offs. I have a little uh, eight-year-old daughter right now. He's at every drop-off uh, at her every day where she is and at the other uh, elementary school as well. What he tries to do is be a friendly face for law enforcement in the schools to make sure he can sort of get the vibe of what's going on before they get to high school. Where So this is like a preventative type of situation. I know the governor's in favor of um, creating more of that interface, okay, at the, at the young level, right? Um, the other thing, too, is, and I know Rep. Brady and I were actually at an event together at um, Teen Challenge in Brockton where it's a, 30, it's, a, it's, a, it's a longer day, it's a longer program, it's a longer commitment uh, for recovery. Uh, 15 days is way too short for somebody to go in and theoretically uh, change their lives. And you need a much longer term commitment. Uh, so I think the governor's plan also is to, is to do that as well. Representative Brady. Thank you. And it's, it's great. We have dear offices in, in a lot of the schools. We have dear offices in Brockton and several other community schools across the Commonwealth. But the problem is when there's budget cuts, you don't have enough funding to have enough dear offices hired. And again, it saves the taxpayers money to put somebody in a rehabilitation facility than to put them in jail and you have to house them when they're not getting any treatment. So I strongly believe in treatment rather than incarceration for these young people who made a mistake in their life. I had a family that went to the West Bridgewater. Uh, they were all part of the West Bridgewater Golf League. Great families. They went to a party. They all tried the Oxycontin. Then they got addicted to heroin because they couldn't afford the Oxycontin. And, and some were not, no longer with us. And again, if they had had the proper treatment, maybe we would have been saving lives. Some of them got put away, and all of a sudden they're back out on the streets again, and it's just as a vicious cycle time and time again. So I, so I, let me just say, I agree with the diversion. I don't, think, I don't think we need to be putting everybody away who's got the addiction issue. It's the dealers that we need to be putting, putting away. We should have taken a stronger stand on dealers going away. And, Hold on. Let's change topics, Erin. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I, we didn't hear from Anna about the opiates. Oh, yes, so. thank you. Aaron, Anna, uh, opiates? Um, well, I just I didn't know about Baker's 72-hour um, painkiller um, thing, but I, I just wanted to say that some people really are in pain, actually, and it's very difficult for them to get their prescription over and over again. Um, so it's, it's a shame that it has had to come to that. I do support um, longer holds, but that 72-hour hold, I think it does infringe on people's civil liberties. Um, so, I, I, but I do think things should be more on a voluntary basis, and there should be maybe longer holds if people are voluntarily willing to seek that help. Um, I've spoken to people who are addicted to drugs just in my campaigning, and, and a lot of them believe that they would just like to have more rehab options, longer rehab options. Um, Treatment so, facilities, is that, is that what you're saying? Yes, mm -hmm. um, but uh, as far as holding people for 72 hours, I, I do think it's a civil liberties issue. Okay. Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, now I want to talk about water, big topic in Brockton and the surrounding communities, um, specifically the Central Plymouth County Water Commission agreement with Brockton. And now, you know, you being in Halifax now, you know, Mon Pond literally stinks, okay? 
Um, there's been algae problems all summer long. They've been treating those. Um, the ponds have been closed west and east at different times. This is something that local town leaders have been going to Brockton officials, asking them to change the way that they're pumping the water in and out that actually hurts the ponds environmentally. This is a big deal. We're hearing uh, Tom Coulter talk about this a lot. So um, my question for each of you, if you are elected to Senate, how do you play facilitator with this specific issue, try to keep each of these very different communities happy when you've got Brockton is on one side of this and the surrounding towns have a different issue. So how do you navigate the, the difficulty of, of the Brockton water crisis, as we're calling it? Rep Deal, do you want to start? Sure. So I'm a customer of the uh, Brockton water. Um, I get the Silver Lake water uh, pumped to me. And uh, yeah, this agreement goes back decades. Obviously, Brockton, for anybody who's unfamiliar, uh, Brockton has the rights to pump that water. And uh, the only sort of caveat is they're supposed to maintain those ponds. And what's been happening is the towns have been maintaining the chemical balances of those ponds to keep them from having the algae blooms and, uh, and those problems. So um, I guess it's been recognized even by members of the Water Commission in Brockton that they have been bad actors in this general uh, process as well. Uh, I know Brockton has been trying to find different solutions. They sit on a current water source themselves, the city. Um, they have the uh, agreement with uh, Aquarians to... Uh, for the contract from them, and then they are pumping from the, uh, the lakes as well, or the ponds as well. So what I think, you know, the mayor, it looks like he's, one of the solutions he's trying to figure out is maybe um, buying the aquarium company out and um, using that as maybe the alternative source. Um, but yeah, I think acting as a referee in the, whoever ends up as senator uh, will definitely be a big part of trying to deal with that situation because all towns are affected. And... Um, I, I think that Brockton even recognizes that they need to figure this situa situation out pretty quickly. So is that something, I guess as a quick follow-up, so that you know, would come as a home rule petition to purchase, most likely to purchase Aquaria. So, so how do you deal with that when it literally comes back to you? So there's, there's two things with the Aquaria. Um, one is that you know, the, the mayor is trying to pitch it as generally a cost saving. Look, here's the contract. We buy it at, at a slightly reduced rate and we have an asset at the end. So that makes sense. You know, it's lease or buy a car. Well, if you're going to need water for the future, um, maybe buy the car, right? Um, but at the same time, Aquaria hasn't been able to deliver on its contract to Brockton the amount of water. So if it's a defective car, do you really want to buy the defective car? It seems to be the question. And I think that's what needs to be resolved before any final decision and whatever is passed up in the legislature uh, goes forward is, is, is it going to be able to ultimately, what they buy, will it be a lemon or will it be a good deal? Okay. Uh, Rep. Brady? Thank you. That's a great question. Um, the water contract with Brockton, getting the water and owning Silver Lake goes back to the early 60s. And Silver Lake was one of the most pristine water resources, even cleaner than the Quabbin Reservoir back in the day. But when the water shortage affected us uh, drastically in the early 60s and then later on in the late 80s, early 90s, Brockton had to come up with another water source. They searched far and wide. They looked at Wells and Whitman. We looked at other sources around the city. Uh, nothing was viable. And then there was a proposal by the Water Commission at the time to go with MWRA, and that's like a four-letter word that you don't even want to talk about because the rates are through the roof. So they came up with this desalinization plan, which was a great idea, but the problem is they haven't been able to live uh, water when the time was needed. There was a water pipe that broke in East Bridgewater, and, and, a, and a friend of mine it went right through his backyard in East Bridgewater, and, and the poor gentleman had to deal with all the mess, and he's still trying to get reimbursed for the cost and the time it affected him. So I think we do have to relook at this contract with the desal plan, but the decision is going to be left as a former city councilor. It's left up to the city council and the mayor to come together. I know I've met with the Halifax Water Commission and, and all the Plymouth County Water Commissions. I know about the algae growth. When they don't use enough water, the algae tends to grow greater. Then when they use too much water, the rates drop so low that they're dipping in a furnace brook and other things. And I want to be the facilitator bringing the residents from Halifax and the Plymouth County Water Commission together. And I've already started to open up that dialogue with our Brockton City Councils and our Mayor to sit at the table to work together to come up with a solution. And Representative Carlton, who I've spoken to on this issue, has endorsed my campaign. I'm looking forward to continuing my dialogue with Representative Carlton as well. Okay, thank you. Anna? Um, well, uh, you know, I'm, I'm new, so I don't know the water situation thoroughly, other than that um, I met the water department in Halifax, and uh, he told me that things are going to get back on track 
um, in about six months, and he feels very proud of his work. Um, but um, and he, he seems to be do, doing a great job. They're doing the water tank over. Um, he told me that we're getting boxed in water right now. And someone explained a little bit about um, the repackaging of the water, but I'm not really sure about it so much. Uh, it looks like there's a, a to-do there that seems um, um, more in the skill of Brockton, a Brockton political thing that they need to work out, um, as I believe Brady had said, between um, the city council and the mayor. So I, I, yeah, so anyway, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, quick follow-up question, just keeping our environmental hats on. So as we all know, or most of us know at this point, um, Pilgrim Nuclear Power Plant looks like that's going to be closing as early as 2017, if not 2019, but the goal is apparently June 2019. So in your opinion, does this create an opportunity for Brockton with the proposed power plant? And what side of the issue do you fall on? Do you support plans to have a plant in Brockton, a different kind of energy plant? Um, do you feel that it's clean energy? Is it emitting bad, you know, fossil fuel emissions? So where do you fall on this environmental issue of how we should be getting our power in the region? Um, Deal, do you want to start? Sure. So um, first of all, uh, the closing of uh, recently two coal-fired plants and now uh, Pilgrim announcing they'll be closing is going to give us a major energy um, gap between what we're going to need and what we have available right now. The, uh, obviously, that supply-demand means that costs are going to go up. Right? And one of the things that uh, the governor now has been talking about is bringing in Canadian hydroelectric. Uh, he's also talked about increasing the natural gas pipelines in. It's not just... Um, the actual natural gas that we, I've spoken to companies who use a major amount of energy, um, a linen company here in Brockton, for example, uh, natural gas that they use to, to heat the uh, water and everything like that, that's one part of their cost, but actually during uh, prime time uh, heat season like winter, uh, they actually they have to rent the pipeline space, so we don't have enough pipeline space really right now to um, keep energy costs low. So, yes, we are going to need more energy sources, wind, solar, the hydroelectric that, that we've talked about. Um, and then at the same time, Brockton has the opportunity to have a power plant. Now, clearly there's been an issue in Brockton about whether this power plant should move forward or not. You know, the, part, the pros are it's in a location where the, pipeline, the, the natural gas pipeline comes down and there's a utility inlet for the power to come in. It seems like a good fit, but at the same time, there's the health risks that are potentially out there. Uh, East Bridgewater borders the, uh, the region, and it makes it for a you know, contentious uh, d dispute over the health issue, right? Uh, Brockton had a referendum on casinos. I am not sure why they haven't had a referendum yet on the power plant. This seems to me the most logical thing. In the town of East Bridgewater, there was a company that moved in. The town had a vote during town meeting uh, whether or not they wanted to allow that town in because there was questions about the materials being handled by that company. Seems like Brockton should City Council, the mayor, the, the people of Brockton should have their voice heard with a referendum vote on that. Okay, thank you. Here we go, uh, Representative Brady. Thank you. You know, this is an issue that's been going on for a long, long time. And we know there's a need for energy. I, I think that the leadership between the governor, the speaker, and the Senate president are all working together to move forward with a new energy plan. I'm hoping it's going to make sense. It's a, it's a good, comprehensive plan. We're looking at that. But um, with the closing of Pilgrim, we've got to come up with other sources. And I think one area is to raise the cap on the solar net metering. People want to put solar uh, panels on their roofs, but they put a cap on the tax breaks they can get in the, in, to keep their energy costs down and to get revenue back from these energy companies. I think we've got to raise the cap on that to offer more to more of the residents. Now, the power plant in Brockton, uh, whether it, it, at this point, you know, they first were a coal-fired power plant as, as well as uh, or oil and as well as gas and all this, they've changed their mind so many times. I've heard loud and clear from the residents I represent, prior to me even becoming a state representative, but I represent the district. The residents in this area do not want the plant there. There's high asthma rates in Brockton. It's affecting the quality of life in Brockton. Uh, and Brockton is an environmental justice community, and also the town of East Bridgewater, the Butzis area. We have this, this big landfill, they call it Mount Trashmore, sitting in the back of people's yards. This area has been dumped upon time and time again, 
And again, if a community like in New Bedford wants a power plant, if they want it, we support power plants down there. But the city of Rockton, it's too close to high rises and schools, they have spoken loud and clear, and I wouldn't be here elected as a city representative without the people's support uh, in regards to my election, without my opposition to this plan. I'm not going to change my mind on it. I've worked, I've filed legislation at the state level. I've worked with local officials. It isn't the right area for a power plant. It's too close to the community there. Again, if they want to put one in another part of the Commonwealth that they support it, that's wonderful. But we've had hearings all across this area, not only residents from Brockton, but from East Bridgewater, who are concerned about all the environmental impact. And that's why I've been endorsed by a couple of environmental groups, including the Sea Area Club, in my election because of my strong belief in protecting our environment. So again, I'm not opposed to it going in other locations in, in, you know, in other areas of the Commonwealth, but the residents have spoken loud and clear, this isn't the right location for a power plant. Thank you. Um, Anna, you said you're a moderate, so where do you fall on this um, power issue? Um, well, I'd like to hear from the residents of Brockton, but I would say overall my opinion is that it would be a bad idea to have one because it's very polluting. It's very bad for the environment. I don't know if anybody's ever been in New Jersey where there's a lot of those, um, those plants, but... Um, I, I support the importing of energies and also renewable energy sources. Um, it, in Plymouth, they have uh, windmills, and I w I'm so happy that they are there. Um, in California, they have a lot of them. And um, I think right off of Route 5, there's um, a lot of solar panels that are just on this empty lot. And I think um, moving in that kind of direction will be really good for the environment and for people. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, just a quick follow-up. Uh, Rep. Deal, did you say, I know you said you wanted to hear from the people of Brockton about this, but are you opposed to it? Where, where are you on the, on the power plant? Yeah, I mean, at this point, the people I've spoken to from East Bridgewater are opposed, yeah. and it seems like the consensus in Brockton seems to be opposed to it. Okay. Uh, I would be opposed at this point, but again, I still think a referendum would be a valuable tool to gauge that. Okay. It happened for the casinos, obviously. Okay. In, in one other okay. I just want to be clear. Yeah. And one other thing that's been very positive for the district in Brockton, Brockton had the first solar bright fields facility to clean up a hazardous waste site that is producing energy currently for some of our city buildings, and it's helped save the uh, cost of the taxpayers as well because it's saving the energy cost putting solar energy into our current system as we speak. All right. If I can throw it in there, I drive a hybrid car too. Doing my little part, right? Right. <laughs> I, I, I would say that there's probably going to this is going to be a, a lot of pressure on whomever is representing the district because with the absence of Pilgrim, there's opportunity here for this kind of energy. So they're going to be looking to you all. Um, so you're absolutely. You know. I think that's why I said this energy plan that is coming out of leadership. I think so far it's making sense, and there is a proposal to put another power plant to replace one further in the south shore that might make more sense for the district. Okay. Let me talk about uh, uh, casinos. Um, the folks voted for a casino in Brockton, speaking of having the, the voice of the people, and uh, the mayor signed a host agreement, and now the, Mash, the Mashpee Wampanoags have gotten the right to build a casino, So, the, and the Gaming Commission has said uh, that is definitely a factor they will consider about whether or not to place a casino here. I presume that the driving force for wanting the casino was really um, jobs or, or the, the proposed um, uh, the proposal to get some more jobs into the area because of the casino work. But now, with the Mashpee, you can't uh, be certain that that's going to happen. And even if, let's say the Gaming Commission said, okay, let's put another one there, well, then what? I mean, then you've got a mess. Then you get no return because the Wampanoags are required to give uh, $17 million back to the, to the district. But if there's a second one, they don't have to give anything, zero. So this is a bad bet all the way around, no pun intended. Mm. I want to know where you all signed on that. I'll start with you, Anna. Where are you? Um, well, uh, I don't know where other people are on that issue, but um, I'm kind of divided because I, I do feel that um, as a Christian, the gambling might not be such a good thing. Um, I lived in, for a time I lived in Omaha, Nebraska, and people would have to travel to Iowa 
to go to the casinos and there was a lot of gambling problems. People would gamble their lives away. It's very addictive. There's a, it brings in a lot of prostitution too but, and things like that, just really a crime even. Um, but then I had lived also for a time in California and the casinos there, they didn't have those elements necessarily. In fact, they were kind of moved away on Native American grounds and they were actually very, it seemed like not like very um, crime ridden. Um, so I, I'm kind of divided about it. I, I don't know what the people want, but I would, I would say that there is a possibility crime could go up. Well, the people voted for it, so yes, they want it. So, they do. Yeah. Well, okay. and it's, it's what people want, you know. It's, um, um, so I, I've seen both sides. I've seen like bad casino areas, good casino areas. It, just, it depends on the management of the area. So I think just paying attention to the management of that, the casino area would be a good advisable thing. Okay. Thank you. Um, Rep. Brady. Thank you. Um, the legislation that we passed, there was overwhelming support statewide for casinos. We passed legislation to allow up to three casinos. Doesn't mean three will be built. Right. In, in the Indian uh, situation as well, they have a right to their um, casino on the South Shore. So the revenue changes if, if one is, is approved and they're still working on whether there's even going to be one further south. Uh, it has to be a recognized tribe, etc. But the, we still do get revenue from it, but not as much at all changes. The other biggest thing is the voters, as well as the Commonwealth residents, vote overwhelmingly in favor of the casino. It was a much closer vote in the city of Brockton, but it did pass. So now we voted, we voted on some legislation to take us as politicians out of the mix to form this gaming commission. So the gaming commission has a final decision whether it goes in Brockton. This is a final one. And they've, they've voted to extend it and everything else so far, but they have not made a final decision. The biggest concern that I have, because I've represented the area for many, many years as a city councilor, putting up with some noise in the area and traffic and so forth, but any time I've called the owners of the fairgrounds, they've been more amenable to me to, to address any issues. It was issues, something as simple as helicopter rides when the fair is in town making noise for the residents. So any time I've gotten calls from residents, I've addressed the issues. And the owner of the fairgrounds have always worked well with me to address any issues that needed to be addressed. Moving forward, the big concerns I have, if it has, ever is approved by the Gaming Commission, because it's in their hands, that we have proper funding to have traffic mitigations and other issues relative to what impact it is going to have with the residents. And I know there's a high school right near the uh, proposed casino that people are concerned about. There is laws in place so that you, you know, it's not like when people are younger and people would sneak into a liquor store to buy a six-pack of beer. Laws are much more strict that we put in place, both the House and the Senate, bipartisan support and legislation to protect the consumers on this and to protect the impact it has on the community. And there's mitigation money back to the community, not only to the city of Brockton, but the surrounding towns. But again, the final decision is going to be left in the... Uh, I know, but the stand. district has a, has, uh, it could be in a position where it gets zero if, they're, if, if the, uh, they give well, another commercial license... Um, to uh, give a license to a commercial. But there is some you know. funding that will still come. It just won't be as much as initially planned. There was a percentage that if there's no Indian casino, the city of Brockton will get more revenue. If there isn't any casino, it gets less, but they do get some funding. Okay. And, and, and the jobs is a big impact too. But again, we may want to make sure that the residents are protected no matter what happens because of the impact into that neighborhood. Rep Deal. So the, um, the casino bill that's passed uh, talks about if there is that tribal casino, the, the money could go down to $6 million, right? Mm -hmm. $6 million in the city of Brockton's budget, which is $375 million, is 1.5%. 1.5% of the city budget, and, and they want to potentially, you know, bring in potential problems that come with casinos for 1.5%. I think it's too bad that the city is looking at this as a Hail Mary of having to bring in a casino for 1.5%. I think what we need to do a better job of in the state and for the city is to grow businesses, reduce regulation, grow businesses so that we can have more jobs and the tax base goes up. We're not dependent on 1.5% coming in for a casino that could have a, a lot of negative effects in the city of Brockton. Talking to so many people that I've gone door to door in Brockton with, they seem very opposed to the casino in Brockton. And while it sounds great that there's tons of money, you're absolutely right. With the Plainville Casino nearby, with the potential tribal casino, uh, now being ordered, and, 
And by the way, the gaming commissioner isn't guaranteed to be awarding Brockton in this casino. Mm. I don't think Brockton should be planning on this casino. And I think this, uh, while it was a close vote, um, I, I'm not necessarily sure it's the best thing for the city of Brockton in the long haul. I think we can... Okay. We're almost up against the clock here, so um, I'm going to start over there with our lightning round questions. <laughs> You want to start, Ed? Okay, this means very short answers, like 30 seconds, okay? <laughs> sure. All right. uh, lightning round question. Obviously, uh, there's been some talk about fantasy sports in uh, the news lately. Is it gambling? Is it not? So to each of the candidates, do you think fan, uh, online fantasy sports counts, uh, should count as gambling? Oh. Start with Representative Brady. Sorry. Thank you. That's a great question. As an older gentleman who's who's not uh, done much gambling over over the course, I I uh, I just learning about this industry that a lot of young people are involved with. But it has to have regulations, just like the lottery has re regulations, just as other betting revenues have to have regulations. And we got to get make sure we're getting a proper tax revenue from this because right now we've heard stories, and I know the Attorney General is looking into this and we're waiting for her Five report seconds. as well, but uh, we have to have proper regulations to protect the consumer and make sure we're getting the proper revenue so they're not skirting the system. Right. Rep deal. I don't think we always have to make our decisions on what's going to bring in more tax dollars. This is a game of skill, from what I can tell. Uh, let, them, let them play their game and let them make their profits. This is uh, an industry that's here in Massachusetts, and it's employing people, it's creating jobs. Let's not overtax everything that pops up. Anna? <laughs> Lightning round, people. <laughs> I'm trying to get in a lot of questions. <laughs> okay, Anna? Um, I, uh, it's, I don't really know anything about fantasy football other than people really enjoy it. <laughs> but um, I guess it, it could be considered gambling. I'd have to look into it a little bit. Um, but it looks like maybe um, it's a good thing. It's, it looks like it's a business for people. And um, so anyway, thank you. Thank you. Okay, okay. Um, I pulled this off the Facebook page, um, yours, Rep Deal, um, from some guy named Alex who wants to know how you feel about the IndyCar series coming to Boston next year. So I thought I'd ask it in the lightning round. You know, I, I think <laughs> I saw that post. Um, because somebody obviously knew about my work on the Olympic issue as far as trying to protect taxpayers from the massive overruns we, were know, we knew were coming. I filed the language in the House to block taxpayer funding of the Olympics. Didn't even get a roll call vote. Um, so uh, it was, it was uh, run in the Senate as the same language to block that. Didn't happen. I partnered with Evan Fauchuk, who ran as an independent for governor. We filed the language uh, for a ballot question mm -hmm. to block that. Uh, here's the thing. Long story short. The IndyCar race, I, at this point, I have not seen any taxpayer funding requests for taxpayer funds. If that happens, I will happily jump into that race as well. Okay. Mike, uh, Rep. Brady? Thank you, and I'm glad that uh, the issue got brought up about the situation at hand. The uh, Boston delegation, we work together as colleagues in the House and the Senate, so the Boston delegation of representatives and senators filed some language long before the question of a ballot question even came to be and I supported the Boston delegation, and my, my name is on this legislation in the letter to not use tax dollars to fund the Olympics. And that got supported long before... Okay, but what about the IndyCar budget. series? The IndyCar <laughs> series, again, we've got to make sure that the uh, consumer is protected. And no matter where they're looking to put it, whether it be Boston or somewhere else, again, we want to make sure the public is protected, and we've got to work together with our fellow colleagues in that area. Okay. Did, did I ask you about it? Yes, Anna. How do you feel about IndyCar series coming to? Uh, it sounds great. Uh, I, don't, I don't really know much about it because it sounds like another guy thing. <laughs> but, oh, um, no, there's some women. Hey, now, wait a minute. <laughs> there's some women in IndyCar. Come on now. <laughs> Go ahead, Anna. <laughs> um, but uh, it sounds like a, a good business opportunity. And, yeah, All right. Thank you. <laughs> Ed? Or Anne, was it Aaron? Was it your turn? Okay, go ahead. No worries. Uh, so Anna, you've kind of answered this a little bit, but um, I'd like to put this to the representatives as well. Do you consider yourself a conservative, a radical conservative, or are you a moderate, or are you a hippie? How about we start with Representative Deal? 
Uh, not a radical conservative. Uh, look, the ballot question for the gas tax, just as a good example, we had we collected 167,000 signatures for that. There were more Democrats than Republicans that signed for the repeal of the gas tax. These are issues that are pocketbook issues that affect everybody. I was elected by my district to represent the interest of them. And that is what I've been working on since day one. Uh, no question. So, you know, no radical. I'm certainly conservative and uh, making sure that I work with everybody. Thank you. Representative Brady. Thank you. I've always thought of myself as trying to be a common self-advocate on behalf of my district. I've worked for my district all my life when I was on the school committee, city council, and the state representative, and I'm going to continue to work for my district and listen to the residents and do the best job possible to represent the residents that I represent and continue to do so. I've had a work ethic that's 24-7, second to none, and no disrespect to anybody here at this panel, but I get the calls late at night from a from a resident that had a snow plow that plowed her in, and an 80-year-old woman, I've gone out and shoveled her driveway, Mrs. Jenna Mazzo, and I've helped out constituents even when the street light is out, even though now that we're at the state yeah, level, okay. there's still no contact. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. <laughs> okay, Anna. Anna? Did she, she answer that right? You, did you answer it, Anna? Oh, um... I think, I, well, I'm, in, I'm running as an independent, I'm kind of moderate, really. Mm -hmm. I, I feel that I, I do identify with some Republican values, though, but I don't know. I, I, I really can't, I can't say at this point. Um, but Can I, I follow up and ask why you're running as independent? Oh, it's just because I registered to vote as an independent. It was, it was an accident, really. Um, but, okay. Uh, <laughs> so you have, but you definitely have Republican leanings, it sounds like. I do, yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Ed? Ed? Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was going to ask, um, obviously, uh, kind of a little, go a little off topic here, but one of the big topics lately that I've been hearing on the radio all the time, major issue, can the Patriots go undefeated this season? One, <laughs> one word answer. Uh, so, Representative Brady? Well, I hope so. With a guy named Brady, they got a great chance. <laughs> <laughs> yes, of course they're going to win this year. Okay. Yeah, they'll totally win. <laughs> Thank you. You want to Okay, here's, here's kind of a personality question. What is your favorite possession and why, but keep it short? It can't be people. It has to be a thing. Start with Representative Deal. Because you had the best reaction. You were like, oh, no. <laughs> have you gotten this question before? <laughs> uh, I have a... Uh, flat griddle to cook pancakes and my daughters every Saturday morning I make blueberry pancakes for them. Mm. Probably my favorite thing because they, they light up when I have the time to make breakfast for them. So. Okay, Representative Brady. Thank you. My favorite possession is also my most difficult possession but my favorite is my home. My parents, they, they worked hard. My father was in the construction industry. My mother was a seamstress working in the factories and she also worked at home stitching but they never had the opportunity to own their own home and I'm so grateful that I've had the opportunity to own my own home. But you've got the issues like everyone owns a home with the weather today. I had to work to make sure my heat was working properly. So, <laughs> Anna? Anna. Um, probably my softball mitt and my running shoes. I'm on some softball leagues. So. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, just a question for me. I haven't heard from you, Anna, on this, but I have heard uh, Rep. Deal and uh, Rep. Brady say, uh, speak very respectfully of, of Thomas Kennedy, uh, and uh, you've called him a mentor, Mike Brady, Rep. Deal, you said you admire him, work with him. I wonder which piece of his legacy you think you'll be moving forward with, because a lot of people in this district admired and supported him as well. Um, so I'll start with you, Rep. Mike Brady. Well, I think he's caring, and um, you know, we've had a great relationship. He's, as I mentioned, he has been a mentor. He served on the city council ward too where I later served. He served in the State House of Representatives, where I later served in the district, and he served as our senator. And I, his work ethic as well. I was working with him in his hospital bed the week leading up to his passing, talking about issues about our community colleges and Mass Street Community College. And he did more from his hospital bed than most people do in a normal day's work out there. And in his faith, too. He had great Five faith seconds. in, in, in mm. Jesus Christ. And I want to follow and work in his footsteps and, and carry on that legacy. And I think, um, based of all the things he's taught me over the years, I hope to carry on moving forward if I am okay. elected to the Senate. All right. Um, Rep. Deal. When, um, 
when Governor Baker called me about running for the seat, he was um, talking to me about how important it would be to carry on the work of Senator Kennedy. He met him back in 93 when he was working under Bill Weld and said that uh, even then, um, Tom's uh, disabilities did, were really not a disability for him at all. He, made, he set the uh, pace for other legislators to do their work. Um, Senator Kennedy came to my wife and I. We opened a, uh, a new business. We, we had a business for 13 years, opened a brand new building we had built, and he was there for the ribbon cutting. Uh, Tom was at every parade in my district, uh, every event that you could make, talking to seniors, uh, talking to kids. That's what I've tried to do, like I said, since I've been in office, and what I want to continue to do as a senator. Okay. Anna. Uh, well, I never met Tom Kennedy, but um, I read about him, and I was uh, very impressed with the fact that he was going to be a priest. And um, I'm very Christian myself, so I, um, I appreciate that about him. I know he, would, he was a very loved person, and they are very hard shoes to fill. Um, as far as his legacy, I heard that he gave out um, four-leaf clovers on St. Paddy's Day, and probably I'd, I'd do that. Um, I am half Irish, so okay. um, thank you very much. Thank you. All right, well, it's time for, our, believe it or not, it's time for our closing statements from, from all of you. Um, and um, I thank the audience for trying to let us squeeze in as much as we can. Um, Anna, why don't we start with you? Well, my name is, did this thing move? Sorry. Uh, my name is Anna Grace Raddick, and I'm, I'm running for state senate um, because of the three laws that I had written to prevent human trafficking and white collar crime. Um, again, uh, one would require 40 hour uh, counseling or interview by a third party who's trained to look for signs of uh, human trafficking before an immigrant and American marry for a green card. And also there'd be educational kiosks in every federal immigration office with a printout of, um, of basically safe houses and resources. And there would be a no-fail quiz that would be a mandate between an American and an immigrant uh, marrying by, whereby a green card is obtained. It could also be for immigrants too, just to let them know about their resources that are available in case they feel that they're being trafficked. And also um, my anti-white collar crime initi initiative, which would provide quick IDs through the local police. There'd be a new statewide human trafficking officer who would access a database and be able to provide the victim with a new social security number and a new civil judge approved name within two weeks. It can take right now three to seven years and sometimes people can never get time. their IDs and by that time it's too late for these people. This is a really important issue. It can happen to anyone. People are being drugged into these situations. They're being drugged into financial trafficking and human trafficking situations. And so I, my, my prayer is that this will be passed in running for state senate. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> Representative Deal. Well, thank you for the forum again, and uh, thank everybody for coming. And uh, I want to thank the, the voters in the district for their consideration in two weeks. Um, on November 3rd, voters will have an important choice to make. Um, they could have a chance to have a senator who has successfully repealed automatic gas tax hikes, save taxpayers billions. Um, they have a, can have a senator who has the political courage to stand up to outrageous pay raises being passed in the dark of night, prohibiting tax dollars for Olympics. Um, they can have a senator who knows what it's like to create jobs, run a small business, uh, a senator who has two daughters that knows how important education is, uh, a senator that will go above and beyond the call of duty for the people of his district, and I have the vision to make a positive difference for the future. So on November 3rd, I'd be honored to have your vote. Thank you very much. Thank you. Rep. And I'm currently a state representative. I'm hoping I have your support to be your next senator. I'm going to continue to do what I've always done is work on behalf of the people that I represent. My work ethic is second to none. I have no disrespect to anybody else running for this office. It's a, it's a democratic society. We have rights for everybody to run for office, and I thank anyone for their participation. But I want to continue doing to protect services, to protect you know, we have roads in deplorable condition. We need money for that. We need to deliver funding for our district. We need to protect our patients. That's why I support a patient safety bill at, at the hospitals, and I got the endorsement of the Mass Nurses Association. 
I want to protect our schools. I've, I've helped get funding for our schools. I want to continue to do that. That's why I've had the endorsement of the Mass Teachers Association, the Boston Teachers, and the American Federation of Teachers. Not because I'm just a union supporter, but because I've been there in the trenches with them, fighting when they wanted to do budget cuts left and right. And, you know, I don't like to pay taxes either, but where are you going to make the cuts when there's not enough funding? That's why we had full day kindergarten. That's why we had after school. Time. And I want to continue what I've always done. Thank you, and I ask for your vote on November 3rd. Thank you. Um, if I made this one public service announcement, and that is everybody in this room is a super voter, great. Uh, but there was low turnout in the primaries for this. And so if every one of you brought five people to the polls, then, you know, these people will not have wasted their time here tonight, for certain. Yes. One mm -hmm. last thing uh, to, to help all the voters out. There is one ballot on all the towns around the city of Brockton for this election. It's a special election, but there is going to be two ballots in the city of Brockton on that day. One for the mayor, the city council, and school committee, and one for the special election for state senator. So no matter who you're voting for or supporting, please remember to to grab two ballots when you go into the voter booth. That's Thank important. You. And thanks very much, Aaron and Ed, for joining me here. Thank, Thank you. you. Good night.